Hello everyone and welcome to the Geomologist Presents. Sorry, I'm like a day or two late on the podcast. It's just been pretty busy with the new job. So what am I going to talk about? I guess that's the other thing. The job has been distracting, so I can't think of what topic I want to talk about. So maybe I'll start with recaps of the games I've been playing and running, mostly running because the play games, the games I've been playing in, well, those are usually, or they have been, on uh, the Dungeon Musings channel run by Kevin Madison, uh, the Dungeon Muser himself. So you, if you want to check out there, I think I played, yes, I played some Warhammer Fantasy in that game, uh, where we have our characters based in Salzamund in the north part of the Empire, and I played a charity game of Cypher System we're all mad here. So it was kind of, it was really cool. I like Cypher System a lot. Uh, there's some tweaks that Kevin made, which I thought were very helpful. And maybe those are house rules that I might use in Cypher System when I run them specifically. So there's this thing, you gain XP, right? I don't, I don't mind the GM intrusions, whatever, but you gain XP. And then sometimes XP is used to trigger your powers, which, you know, kind of uh it's not a deal breaker for some people but leaves a bad taste in someone's mouth why are you getting rid of my advancement i have to use it for x right so then maybe or what kevin did is basically and it was a one shot anyway so he made those intrusion xp for example um based on he made those into action points and then uh the action points would be separate from the xp pool right so um, and then, so you'd keep those XP and it'd be more kind of like, I guess the way I think about it is like fate and fortune in, um, in Warhammer fantasy where fate is a permanent loss, but fortune, you know, is going to reoccurring. So they're two separate, they're the same number, but they're two separate, uh, used for two separate things. So you don't lose the XP Basically, if you were to run this, multi, you know, in a campaign type game, you wouldn't lose the XP when you got these action points. And, but you could still use those action points as you would XP uh, for, I think it gives you, I don't know if it gives you like a re-roll, but I think it gives you like an up or down, like a, what's called a focus maybe, where you can, where you can lower or effort. It, 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 I think it gives you an effort where you can lower the target number, something like that. Um, or at least, I mean, that's how I think XP or using that XP works. Maybe it is a reroll. I don't know. But maybe I'd throw that as a house rule, too, that ba that you can just use it for effort, for a free effort um, as an action pool or action point. I don't know. Uh, it's an interesting thing. That's a, that's a huge topic that comes and goes now and again in the anchor sphere. Well, it's going to be not so anchor sphere anymore. But um, in the podcast sphere, I guess. But um, yeah, and that is uh, whether or not you, if you have a meta currency, you use it ahead of time or after. What's interesting is like Modifius 2D20, right? You can use the momentum to add to your dice pool ahead of time. But then like in a game like Octum Cthulhu, you have a separate currency um, called Fate. I believe it's called, where that gives you like the re-roll after the fact, which is interesting, you know, take it or leave it, whatever. I know, I, I feel like, yeah, maybe I'll get to that. That's an interesting topic and how that works. And um, I guess it depend on the mood, my mood as a GM, whether I think it's cool or not. So we've had a couple games. I'll talk about the games I play with my home group first, and that's Blood Lords and Warhammer Fantasy, um, sorry, Blood Lords is not the name of the game. It's Pathfinder 2, and we're playing through the Blood Lords Adventure Path. We actually got a lot done last Thursday, and we kind of, one of the, the characters kind of separated. They know that the bad guys are holed up in this sort of uh, brewery that has a tap room, <laughs> which is a funny homage to breweries and tap rooms, I guess. And they, they go to this place. Uh, one, a couple players 
um, I thought it was cool, took the initiative to, um, to basically climb on the roof of the structure. It's kind of like a caravanassery, but with tents and canvas, very thick canvas uh, strung up um, on this block and then bone all over it. So I made the stealth roll very difficult, but the, the characters succeeded. And then they got the kind of, in a way, so two of the characters, the stealthy guys, um, which were uh, Slavin, who is a elf, alpha, they don't call them Tiflings anymore. Uh, and they, were they Tiflings in Pathfinder anyway? So he's got, he has like a, a bloodline from, he's not a sorcerer, he's a, like a rogue, but he's like one of the cerebral rogues. And he has a bloodline that's uh, demonic or something, or hell, hellspawn. I think they're called hellspawn. The other player is a swashbuckler, so I think fighter archetype, fighter type but uh, dex-based, and he's a skeleton, like a living skeleton. So it's kind of funny. Anyway, so they go in, the other three characters, and that guy's name is Brian. Um, I, I want to say Brian Blessed, but I don't know if that's true. Um, he has Brian the something. Anyway, so the other three characters, which were Ash, uh, Urian, and so Ash is a plant guy, I can't remember the name of the, the species, a plant guy monk, and uh, Urian's is a Dampier, elven origin, Dampier um, Inquisitor, and the last character, Shen Fane, is a Dampier origin, elf origin also, they might be cousins or brothers, and a witch with the hag bloodline which is very funny and interesting in this context. So, so they kind of go into the bar place um, while the guys are kind of going in. And they did a good job, I think, of separating like what one group is doing from the other, like metagame-wise. Um, suffice us to say, the, I thought what was fun in the game is that uh, Ash caused a, a, a distraction with some of the other patrons in the fact that he kind of commented on the beer and how it was swill. He got the... He didn't... So the... It's so remember, this is an undead city, so the bartender is a ghoul, and then there's a couple thugs who are like um, the wait staff, and he gets, and that there's some patrons, right, some random patrons, I just rolled randomly how many patrons, it said there's a few patrons there, blah, 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 so I rolled randomly, and um, Ash got him riled up to comment on the, on the, the beer that there's only one type, and I said, well, how can you run an establishment like that? You should have multiple types, blah, blah, blah. So again, so sort of a, a reference to real life and like, you know, everyone needs to get their, their check-ins or different types of beers. Um, there's an app called Untapped that a lot of a beer aficionados use. And some of them, don't, they don't call it like going and drinking a pint of beer. They go to get a check-in, which I think is strange. But I mean, I use Untapped. It's fun to do. It's fun to rate your beers. And then, so you know kind of what you like, if you liked this beer before. Um, but I know some people who like only check in one time, one beer, and if they, and they delete their check in if they're, it's weird. Anyway, so it was kind of a reference, a strange, a veiled reference to that. Suffice us to say, Ash did get them riled up. A fight ensued, which is enough of a distraction for the witch who had turned themselves invisible to sneak in through the, the bartender's door into the back and then the player you know and the meanwhile the other players had started a fight uh, eventually there was they're they sneaking around eventually though as the players snuck into this place fights ensued and the fights were occurring in different places um so even and then some players were still sneaking around so for example the uh elven rogue was still sneaking around elven hellspawn rogue was still sneaking around and a couple of players they have this redundancy where they um, in the game, you can become a corpse talker. So essentially, you don't just destroy mindless undead because they're they're like the labor force in the country of Geb. So you can control them, like kind of do like uh, almost like you do like an animal handling check, but it's like zombie handling or skeleton handling. And based on your level, it determines the difficulty. And so the characters are able to avoid a lot of encounters where they kind of calm down the mindless undead in the area and not cause a big ruckus. So they had to deal with the ghouls 
and sort of the the uh, the human um, employees that were all associated with this uh, this gang that they had been pursuing. And the gang, um, just to say what was important about all this, the gang was trying to create to poison the uh, the grain supply of the country. Um, so the, you know, there, there's a lot of undead, so they don't need that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but there is a there is a lot living uh, population in the country, and they need foodstuffs, and it was being poisoned, and this gang had been doing it. So the characters had found all the information about this, and then tracked it down to this brew pub place, brewery with tap room, let's say. So so it's been pretty cool, and like one of the so by the end of it. Um, and there were some really neat um, instances, I think. One instance is one of the players that got kind of caught, separated by the other players, by a ghoul and a couple of thugs. And he's like, um, he's like, guys, guys, I need help. But then when his turn came around, he like, like uh, he has this returning um, star knife that they found earlier in the adventure. And he chucks it and he gets a crit, hits the ghoul in the head, one shots the ghoul you know, comes back to him and he slices, he and his uh, pet companion, who's a vampire dog, slice into this other thug, take him down. Um, and then there's one thug left and he's probably going to be like, get it. He's going to, you know, get out of, the, get out of Dodge, you know? So, um, so yeah, he did, he did pretty well there. The other characters kind of found, um, found the boss in the place more or less. They skipped the Lieutenant even though I gave a, a strong hint to one player that the lieutenant was in this room and you heard humming, like someone was doing some work and humming and the kind of character ignored it. Um, there was a weird instance where the character, well, one of the characters had disguised himself as a, as a gang member and the character rolled a critical failure and did not want to use a hero point or did not have any hero points uh, to change that outcome. So he thought, and he started you know, tracking and chasing this one guy to kind of, you know, see where he was going and then gank him. But it was his own, but he met a game wise. He knew as the other player. I think some of the other players got annoyed with that. So that's kind of interesting. So how does that, that maybe that begs a question. How do you deal with that when a character um, over meta games, no, under meta games, or, you know, even when the other players are like, this is this guy. This is our guy. Oh, but he's not. He's disguised as something else. But they're like, but this is our guy. Anyway, some players got annoyed with that. So I don't know. It's very interesting. So um, eventually they come to the, they find the boss and they start a fight with the boss. We didn't get to finish it because uh, we play at a gaming store at Dragon's Lair. And it was it was getting late and they close at a certain time. So what's interesting is I think we're going to switch my friend just got this really fancy schmancy uh gaming table so i think we're going to switch over to his house so we don't have like a hard stop you know if we're in the middle of a fight we'll finish the fight but this is t- it was what was really funny is that the boss that they're fighting is also a a uh, a changeling well this well this one is a changeling with a hag hag is a hat is a witch with a hag bloodline a changeling this time uh, so so the the witch in the party totally recognized what was going on. So I think we left, so there's this like magical cauldron that's causing like area effect damage to all the players. They're fighting her. And then we realized also what's very interesting is this party makeup is such that they all, they're all a bunch of debuffers. So they all have abilities to like get the target off balance, make the target clumsy. Um, One of the characters is able to taunt a target and, lower its wisdom if they're successful so they're kind of debuffing their main target which is great in a boss fight um the the boss is dishing out some damage or and then the boss also casts some hexes as well so that when they attack it they do they take damage on themselves much and then but the the witch in the party did that to one of the melee characters so it all sorts of shenanigans um pathfinder 2 i think it started off initially like the first session was kind of slow but it's really picked up and i'm shocked that that five sessions in we're almost finished with the first book so this next session being the fifth session of this game will be you know and i think that's only because the first session was so slow 
um, and characters had to, some explaining that some had never played Pathfinder 2. But uh, we're going to finish this book, and then um, maybe, I don't know if we're going to do a palate cleanser or not. We'll see. We usually do a palate cleanser in between books in an adventure path. Uh, we may or may not, like a one-shot or a one-shot that lasts usually like two sessions, and we'll finish something up that we've started and then move on to uh, the next thing, um, the next book, which is called uh, Grave, Grave Dirge or something like that. So where they pursue in the leads that they discovered um, about the, this plot to um, kill the human poison, the human popul or the living population in Geb. Um, they also, I think they're also poisoning the grain. So a lot of grain gets exported from Geb. So to really affect or start some trouble with some neighboring uh, countries as well. So, so it's pretty, pretty fun. I really enjoyed the kind of, the cool, like sort of infiltration shenanigans, you know, like even when these guys were sneaking about, they had to like get their dag their dagger. I didn't make them roll like every time. Cause you know, you know how the rule is like you make it, you make a character roll, you make a player roll stealth enough for the character. Eventually they're going to fail, which is kind of frustrating. So I got kind of just give them a blanket, um, a blanket roll at the beginning and if something dramatic changes like for example they start sawing through the canvas then there's another roll but but in both cases actually they rolled better and then the cool thing is you don't really do in pathfinder 2 you don't have to do like um you just figure out the target number for the opposition almost like a passive uh, perception type of thing you don't have to roll unless they're actively looking you really don't have to to roll um, the, the opposed roll, which is kind of nice too. So it makes it makes it a lot simpler and quicker. So um, anyway, well, that is Blood Lords. So yeah, that was a 16 minute, 17 minute ramble on Blood Lords. So let me take a pause here and uh, then I'll talk about our Warhammer fantasy game last night. So another crazy thing about this particular episode is I'm doing this all in the car. Um, in one take and I'll probably add intro and outro music and all that jazz but I don't have any call-ins surprisingly even though I got a lot of call-ins for two episodes ago but I didn't get any call-ins on the call-in response episode okay so um yeah I think a lot of it seems like a lot of people in the sort of podcast verse of this small group of podcasters that we um listen to are getting a little discouraged since the time is coming close to where um, Spotify for podcasters is going is going to make it more difficult to use like a phone app uh, to record, and you're going to have to record all in one session and then put it all together, you know, with all the music and all that kind of stuff um, using Audacity or other platforms, and then put it as one file uh, into the platform. I don't know. It just makes it a little more work and another step. So we'll see how that goes. All right, Warhammer Fantasy. And I think my comment with Warhammer Fantasy is, wow, uh, these player characters have a lot of fortune points. And that for what fortune points allow you to do, that was my impression uh, last night uh, when we played. And maybe I was just a little cynical feeling. Um, I did something different, too, is uh, just based on a podcast that I heard. Maybe maybe it was it's probably one of Connor Lee's podcasts recently, where the GM said, "Well, you know, I, I used to have a screen and I took away the screen, and I I usually don't have a screen. Like I don't have a screen for Pathfinder Two, or whatever. And people see my my one my series of ones or my series of twenties, uh, they come and go. Um, I think one of the players in the Blood Lords just as a as a non sequitur here um, says, "Oh, there's my twenty, because I usually I usually crit him." at least once a game, once a session. Um, one time I double critted him and took him out um, or made, caused him to gain the dying condition as it, as it is called in Pathfinder 2. So anyway, a lot of fortune points last night and, and uh, there's two kind of fights that we had. Uh, the first fight was sort of a random, it was a random encounter. So I feel like when the player characters are doing things to, to stop chaos, there are times when the eye of chaos falls upon you. And then, of course, my players start singing the eyes of Texas are upon us and put out the horns for uh, Texas Longhorns and quote uh, Matthew McConaughey, all right, all right, all right, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, 
So there was a random encounter. The eyes of Zinch, which is the Lord of Change or the God of Trixie Magic, the Chaos God of Trixie Magic, fell upon them. And I had this uh, random encounter where a bunch of, they fought a bunch of pink horrors. And pink horrors are like these amorphous pink blobs with multiple arms that laugh and giggle and hop all the and hop and skip all over the place. They're kind of silly, um, but they can dish out some damage. And also, they um, they definitely uh, they definitely they have multiple attacks. And then when you take them out, they turn into they split into two blue horrors. Now, because these demons are unstable, um, there's a rule in there that if you have um, X amount of advantage over the creature, uh, then you, um, you, they take damage at the end of their turn. So that really helped the party. Uh, it wasn't really that much of a challenge. It was just kind of a, a weird a red herring I wanted to throw in and remind them that Chaos is still looking at them. But I do realize that until uh, before the characters got all their freaking... all their ramped up their advantage because I, I have a rule that you can get your advantage up to one of the suggestions up to twice your initiative and they're fourth tier characters so they got a lot of they got a lot they can get up to like 10 or 12 in the advantage and they keep they keep winning right so then they gain advantage they win on defense they win on offense um, some some of them have talents where you need more than two guys to to gang up on them as well so because you would lose advantage if you're ganged up upon, um, and some are better than some are better than others. But I think a big thing that causes this is like um, at least I observed it last night, um, and I shouldn't be frustrated because it is what it is, and, and it wasn't my intent wasn't to blast all the characters. I didn't send like a giant monster or a greater demon after them. Right, it's a kind of bunch of you know, mid-level minions. I just wanted to see how they did. And I kind of had two per character and they took care of them as well as they should. But I did notice that they they succeeded more often than not because of that extra role that they had. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know. I can't see all the roles and I'm not accusing any character, but they're like, oh, I missed. Oh, let me re-roll that. Um, and then they, when they re- do the re-roll, then usually it's a success. Um, so, so that it is what it is. And I know one character, at one point I did get a critical success on the character, but he's like, oh, I ignore criticals because he has like the super duper Gromrel armor, uh, which is, I think, I think it's, it's kind of broken in the game, truth be told. I know Gromrel armor has always been there, but in this incarnation of the game, it, like it prevents critical hits, right? And there are ways to get around critical hits if you use your meta currency, which I'm, I'm for. It's like one character got crit in the head, and he, he's wearing a helmet, so he says, okay, I just use a fortune to get rid of, you know, to make my helmet absorb it. That's kind of our house rule. Like, the rules as written is that is that you can destroy your armor to get rid of a critical, which I have house ruled it to make it a little more challenging that they have to use, actually use a meta currency to do that, a fortune point to do that. So, um, so anyway, so I did... And the other encounter was more interesting. It was a fun encounter against Skaven. Um, and that's kind of more along the plot line. They got to this town. It has been deserted. Uh, they found evidence that all the people in this village, a mining village, or a, a village that supports a mine nearby, uh, were abducted in the night. Uh, some of them made sort of a last stand, uh, including like the priest of Ulrich, who was killed and tortured, it looked like. And a bunch of miners in a in a in the um, boarding house, and they the ones that were survived or the ones that were killed were kind of just tossed unceremoniously behind the bar. And then they also learned the player characters learned that um, that the rest of the uh, people in the village had been captured and actually um, mutilated. Their their eyes had been um, removed. And um, then they're like, whoa, we got to find these Skaven and deal with them. So uh, they did. Uh, it was a kind of a fun. I think the funnest thing is uh, one of the wizards is now like a, uh, is now fourth tier. So he's like a master wizard. So he can, what I like about this player too is that, I mean, he could be casting battle spells and blow things up, but he's kind of more into the game and the verse. So he, and he's now, because he has a battle magic, 
um, he's a war wizard or a battle wizard who took this talent, he can cast a spell that is um, five that he only needs five successes or less automatically, and then he can still do something. So he can cast a spell and still fight or do something else. And he's he cast a spell that debuffed like the pink horrors and the other demons in the group. He cast a spell where he turned into like a, a mouse or a rat and scurried around and, and looked at, you know, kind of scoped out the mine. In the meanwhile, he cast another spell where a, another player character could see through his eyes. So he had a lot of cool utility spells. And, and that was fun for me because that's kind of, yay, the wizard is very, it becomes very useful and not just throwing down, you know, fireballs, which I, I think is kind of fun. So um, they, so he was, so, so this rat, and then, so I gave him a bonus to his stealth. So he kind of snuck past and was letting people know where the, the sentry, the skaven, which are, you know, rat folk, basically evil rat folk that worship chaos and love to eat warp stone, um, which is actually the moon, which is maybe a reference to cheese, the moon being cheese. Anyway, so um, it is the old world and Warhammer fantasy. You got to, they give them some silly, you got to give them some silly, right? So, so anyway, so uh, eventually he like finds that uh, there's this uh, Skaven engineer and they're setting up to blow uh, the collapse, the mine, because uh, they've dug into there with uh, another strange machine that Skaven are, love to, to make. It's called the warp grinder and it has a drill bit that is warp stone. Um, so there's a, warp, there's a warp grinder crew a bunch of clan rats, some Skaven slaves, which are Skaven in rags. Um, and then there's the warp, en- the engineer. And uh, so we, the mage, the wizard uh, lets them know. The wizard's name is Morastra, by the way. And he has a menagerie. Among them is the, uh, the mastiff named Fang, who's a hero among the group. And then, um, or, and the group mascot, I think. He's been injured, and he, like the last several... Uh, sessions he's been injured because he took a critical hit in a fight and he'd been injured and, and recovering from that but he finally got to go on the road with the crew uh, this time so that's my neck popping if you could hear that in the background so anyway the uh, uh, the other one of the other player characters they, they move up and they systematically kill the sentries very stealthily uh, the, the sentries saw them but they got the jump on them they go on the initiative and they were able to take out the sentries before the sentries could act um, so then they get to this room where the warp engineer is about to set all these explosives off to blow it up. And that's why I thought it was great thinking uh, for, um, from Marastra's part. I feel like Marastra was probably the hero of the, uh, of the day. And he, he basically chewed through all the, the, f- the cords, the fuse cords. So like when the, if the warp engineer were to light the, the master fuse, it would just stop before it got to the, the barrels. And he also noticed what the, the sigil that was marked on the barrels, which, which is a clue for later, uh, later in, the, uh, in the adventure. So, uh, so they stopped him. Uh, the fun, a fun part was like uh, when they got there, the, uh, one of the, so Reginald, who's the duelist, took a shot. He gets to shoot before initiative. Then we rolled initiative. The warp engineer won. Um, but he was already, he was already, ma- he was already, massively injured from the shot um, by Reginald. So he ran, and Reginald was wanting to chase him, um, but, like, the range of the pistol's not great, and the, he, and this guy just ran. So And he ran because he kind of his morale broke. If you get shot um, and you're not immune to psychology in the game, then uh, there's a chance that you will, you know, run away after you get shot, um, kind of, like, lose your cool... Uh, lose your coolness under fire so the skaven warp engineer did do that uh warp any anyway skaven engineer did that started running um but uh, another character sebastian chased him down and he has a bow and even with the minuses for shooting into in a dim light uh, he was able to chase him down and shoot him down with his bow uh, shoot, shot got a critical hit in the back of the head actually uh, which is kind of kind of cool so took him down and then uh the other funny thing that happened was that one of the characters, one of the characters uh, named Ulrich, um, not Ulrich because that would be blasphemous in this world, he attacked the warp grinder crew. He didn't take down the, the, the assistant, so then the warp grinder 
operator was able to attack him, and then I crit him, and and he went down with the warp warp grind to his uh, mechanical arm. This character has a mechanical arm, courtesy of Dwarven Smiths. Um, so he went down, but fortunately it was his mechanical arm, so he wasn't like bleeding out everywhere um, from that critical hit. And then they, the rest of the player characters mopped, mopped up the Skaven. It wasn't a tough fight, but it was just sort of a situational. Um, curiously, they did not find the villagers, so I think, and that's where we left it. So I think um, they might go down the tunnels since they weren't blown up and see if they could find the villagers. Or maybe those villagers have been taken elsewhere and they might see them later in the adventure. Anyway, so uh, those are my recaps. That's all I got uh, this time around. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the Geomologist Presents. If you have any comments or questions, you can uh, send me an email or leave me a message, a voice message, and send that to geomologist at gmail.com. You can also send me or leave me a message through Discord. I'm hashtag Carl Rodriguez or at Carl Rodriguez. I don't know if there's a hashtag anymore. Uh, the intro and outro music are done by TJ Drennan. Oh, I also have a SpeakPipe account that you can leave about a 90-second message. My wife, Amy, does the cover art, cover clip art for this podcast. And uh, all I have left, left to say is good night and good rolling.